One gram per pound ideal body weight. So I'm 110 pounds. That's 110 grams of protein. Not that hard to do. It's not that hard. To, it's yeah. not that hard to do. And then people can decide if they want carbohydrates or fats after that. Based upon their activity level, exactly. their body composition goals, all of that. Based upon their activity level, based upon are they, you know, insulin sensitive? Can they tolerate carbohydrates? Are they training? Mm -hmm. Really um, important. Yeah. The capacity to store protein really doesn't exist other than the amino acid reservoir in our muscles. Can you go through periods of uh, protein restriction? You can, and, and we'll talk about that. But for me, the one gram per pound ideal body weight is a daily thing. That's not to say that an individual couldn't go through a period of time, say four days, for protein restriction. I think that we may find evidence that that is beneficial at some point. And when I say protein restriction, what kind of protein am I really targeting? I'm, I'm really targeting the uh, methionine and the sulfur amino acids, which are just a, a, a section, you know, a kind of amino acid, which, which I think is where uh, Longo's work comes in and these protein restriction camps. But I don't think it's a lifestyle. I mean, you're talking about very targeted, specific times. And this would be a cyclical thing so be. as to induce autophagy exactly. or something like that? Yes, a stress. So it's, you know, for the science nerds out there, it's the integrated stress response. Today's show with Dr. Gabrielle Line is brought to you by Myoscience Nutrition. As you can tell, we're talking a lot about the importance of skeletal muscle, the importance of having adequate muscle mass for longevity, the many roles that muscle plays when it comes to overall health. And one way to support muscle is by way of exercise, friends. I can't say this enough, but there's a natural product, a natural supplement that is legal and very effective for helping to optimize muscle when you're exercising. That's called creatine. We're going to talk about creatine later in this episode. In fact, scientific studies show that when you pair creatine with electrolytes, you get a synergistic benefit. So that's why we created over at Myoscience the electrolyte sticks that are one of the only electrolytes out there that feature red mineral salt, Albion chelated minerals and therapeutic dosages, as well as creatine and taurine to help you recover and have amazing workouts. So you can read some of the 330 plus reviews over on our website, myoscience.com. You can save using the code podcast at checkout. There's now two flavors. You have the lemon lime flavor that tastes phenomenal as well as the original orange flavor and an unflavored that is coming very soon. So again, to save on a very novel pre, post, and intra-workout formulation that is featuring both electrolytes and creatine, a corner nutrient to support your muscle health, you can use the code podcast at myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com, myoscience with an X. And let's cut back to it with Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. So Gabrielle, it's great to be back with you again. So we've talked a lot before about muscle protein synthesis, the importance of protein, that muscle is an organ linked with longevity and all that. And I think there are some lingering questions for a lot of people, particularly as it relates to, I, this is a personal question that I sort of struggle with. We know that muscle is so important for aging and keeping us out of elderly homes and living independently. But then there's this whole side of like mTOR overexpression, cancer, chronic disease, right? So how do we grapple with that? I know you probably think about this and talk to patients about this a lot. Yeah. We wanna maintain our muscle mass, but at the same time, you know, some people are worried about fueling cancer potentially with the protein or the whatever. So yeah. let's sort of talk about how you think about this. Um, first of all, I really appreciate that question. And the question comes, you know, kind of in two veins is where I'm hearing it. The first one is from a longevity perspective, because a lot of individuals in the space are saying, you know, protein restriction is the way to go as it relates to longevity. Now, I would like to highlight that that's probably only five people. Yeah. And there is a whole other group of individuals who are either trained geriatricians like myself or experts in sarcopenia and aging that would all agree that dietary protein and muscle are critical, not important, but actually critical factors for longevity and aging. Uh, and then you bring up the second part of that question, which is how do we understand the concept of mTOR and cancer, longevity, and, and chronic mTOR overexpression. Mm -hmm. First thing that's really important to do is, is what is mTOR? And I know that your audience probably knows what mTOR is. It's a mechanistic target of rapamycin. And it is its purpose is really growth promotion. So not growth initiation. I know that you had mentioned cancer. Mm -hmm. And cancer is a disease of the genome. And when we think about a disease of the genome, a uh, growth promoter wouldn't cause cancer. Just mechanistically, that's, it's not the way that it actually works. Mm -hmm. So the concept of 
dampening mTOR, which again is this growth promoter and really critical for muscle protein synthesis, doesn't make any sense as it relates to longevity, especially as it relates to muscle. And you're probably thinking, well, how is that possible? Everybody is saying reduced dietary protein. Where is mTOR? So mechanistic target of rapamycin is part of this pathway for growth. It's in actually every tissue. It's in the brain, it's in the pancreas, it's in the liver, and it's in the muscle. mTOR is exquisitely sensitive to amino acids in skeletal muscle, mm. different than it is in the pancreas and the liver. And you're thinking, okay, well, what are some of the things that stimulate mTOR overall? And that is glucose, insulin, excess calories, and protein. However, for whatever reason, individuals... Um, are looking at the amino acid component, the stimulation of mTOR from leucine, as for whatever that target for mTOR stimulation and propagation. But I just mentioned that mTOR is actually stimulated by multiple other modalities. Mul yeah, multiple other factors like insulin, um, excess energy, and also even exercise. Mm -hmm. But we really have to put this all in context. And when individuals are saying, well, we need to decrease mTOR stimulation, which again, is just one singular pathway, because they are concerned about uh, cancer promotion, we really have to, to, to take a step back. And we have to think, okay, well, number one, what is cancer? And we know cancer is a disease of the genome. And number two, what is one of the biggest risk factors of cancer? And that's obesity. And then number three, what is one critical factor in the survivability of all cancers? Do you know what that is? Um, I would think age, but maybe muscle mass. It's I'm muscle. Guessing. Okay. It's muscle. Irrespective of the kind of cancer, it does. that's very important. It doesn't matter what kind of cancer an individual has. Their survivability is increased with their muscle mass. So their capacity to survive cancer is directly related to their muscle. Very important point. So the other part, really important. Okay, so now, you know, and we're gonna get to the question, why was mTOR, why has mTOR been targeted as it relates to dietary protein, which I think is a really important conversation. But if people truly care about mTOR stimulation, and there is this fundamental belief that this mechanism is going to decrease longevity, then we have to think of the other ways in which, you know, the other ways in which mTOR is stimulated, and that's excess insulin, excess calories. Mm -hmm. To me, that would be chronic overfeeding of higher carbohydrate foods, not discrete meals of dietary protein. I can appreciate, and I think everybody can appreciate this overstimulation of if someone has cancer, a perpetuating a growth state could potentially be a problem. But again, prevention of cancer, propagation of cancer, these are all different things, all wrapped up into one conversation of mTOR. Right, so I think it's important. Uh, we know this like as people who read research and things like that but if you were to go have a slurpee from 7-eleven or go drink a soda you're going to raise glucose and therefore insulin and you will stimulate this growth factor you this will stimulate them for, exactly so yeah I, and i think epidemiologically we would see like bodybuilders and athletes would have a disproportionately higher prevalence of cancer if in fact this connection between dietary protein and mTOR and cancer was sort of there was a stronger correlation there, right? Because some bodybuilders are eating 400 grams of protein per day. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there's not a higher prevalence of cancer in that subset of the population. So what I think it's important for people to recognize is it's not just protein that is stimulating this so-called, you know, th this mechanistic link associated with cancer and accelerated aging, the overexpression of, of mTOR by way of in increasing too many calories, chronic right. feeding, snacking. Yeah. But it, it doesn't, you're exactly right, and it doesn't make any sense to pin to pin that on dietary protein and right. to pin that on amino acids. It, it, it doesn't make sense. And then the next question is, you know, if dietary protein causes cancer, we should be able to say this is the mechanism that in human trials has been, we've been able to uh, show that this research works. Not taking mechanistic data. There, there was one paper in 2014 that, maybe it was 2016, that really did a disservice that we are going to, it's going to take two decades to undo. And that was a paper by Levine. And I think that that was Walter Longo's group. And by the way, these are fine scientists. Mm -hmm. But the reality is it was published in Cell. And, and Cell at the time was a newer journal. And it's not a nutrition-based journal, right? So it's basic science, which is very valuable, right? It's like the Super Bowl. Yeah. However, what happened was they took NHANES data, which is the largest data set. They, they pulled certain uh, data sets. They 
you know, looked at mechanism and then they said, okay, well, protein, cancer, IGF-1, this is, this is the cause, dietary protein. And obviously the protein experts were sent, you know, came back and said, okay, you're recommending now below the RDA. So you're saying that individuals, so the RDA is 0.8 grams per kilogram. You're now recommending people should eat what? 0.3 grams per kilogram, right? And we know that the RDA is the bare minimum to, re to prevent deficiencies. Mm -hmm. So this paper really did a disservice in the way that it created associations. And of course, media picked it up and it was this whole boom. But the reality is uh, all the protein experts, not all, that, that's a bit cheeky. Many of the world leading protein experts, one including uh, my mentor, Dr. Donald Lehman, Stu Phillips, Doug Patton Jones, Heather Leidy, these individuals that have been in the space for over two decades said, listen, this, the way in which this paper was done, we've run it through professional statisticians who are familiar and work with NHANES data, and the uh, correlations and the associations that you've put are inaccurate, like they're just wrong. And Cell never published this. Mm -hmm. And you know, the question is why? And um, you know, maybe it was perhaps that some of the authors were on the editorial board, nobody will know. And, and I strongly encourage that individuals go look for this uh, data and, and this, this letter to the editor, but it's really critical to understand that when something like that comes out, it, it does a true disservice and it really confuses people. Mm -hmm. And that is what I think happened. And listen, it's no different than what happened with cholesterol. Same, yeah. Right, which by the way, was taken out of the guidelines in 2015. Mm -hmm. But we're, you know, so these things are, it all becomes a narrative and then the question becomes who stands to benefit. It's tough. And that paper was cited, I think, 2,000 times, you know? And, and so it's considered a high-impact paper. A lot of people are so you referencing that. know exactly that. what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that episode you did with Stu was amazing. Um, and then he, I think, is doing subsequent follow-up research yeah. with a larger cohort exactly. to be able to further tease out this purported connection with protein intake and cancer. I don't know where that stands. Have you talked to him um, I, I don't know if it's been published yet. I'm sure I would have heard about it. So it hasn't been published yet. But again, this is, these are really critical questions. So. Does dietary protein cause, and we're talking about cause, cause cancer? Absolutely not. And I would say that the individuals within that space would also agree. Um, again, if, if, M if individuals are going to say, okay, well, it's this pathway, mTOR, then stop overeating carbohydrates and stop having excess calories. And pancreas, liver, and muscle are all different. That's a really good point. And I think one aspect of that paper, they were highlighting a link, not to deviate off mTOR too much, yeah, but IGF-1 is talked about a lot. And that I, IGF-1 overexpression is also linked with, with increased growth and potentially causing cancer. But there's this interesting connection with IGF-1 and there's an age association and it's sort of like a U-shaped curve. A after 65, higher IGF-1 levels, and that's sort of how you introduce this conversation saying, when we get older, muscle is so important for health that higher IGF-1 is linked with lower cause of excess, I think it was all-cause mortality. And that's been shown, even Walter Longo recently published mm -hmm. a paper on that. Um, so how do you explain that to people? Because that's another concern. I don't know if the activists are still talking about mm. IGF-1 as much as they used to, but it seems like that's related to mTOR and growth and cancer. So Yeah, you know, how I think about it is, I, I think that there are the obvious things that relate to cancer and disease right? And that is obesity and muscle. And then there are the more subtle aspects where people are questioning whether it's, you know, mechanistic target of rapamycin, or should we induce autophagy? Or do we need to worry about IGF-1? And I think that those are all distractions from the obvious picture of skeletal muscle is critical as an organ system. And, you know, it's been decades overlooked and underappreciated. And obesity, we have a massive, massive problem. And I hate to wor use the word obesity epidemic because an epidemic kills people slowly, mm. right? But if we call it an obesity epidemic, then no one has to do anything about it. And we can just kill, still talk about how it just exists without input from uh, an obesogenic environment, from out, from, without input from uh, big you know, companies that perhaps push these- um, Hyperpalatable foods. To or, us, yeah. yeah. So, you know, if someone were to ask me, do, am I concerned about elevated levels of IGF-1, I would say, well, you know, listen, IGF-1 is highest when people are young, and if that were true, then probably all the younger individuals with uh, robust IGF-1s would have cancer, and right. we don't see that. Right, it's more of an age associated. Interestingly, though, exercise increases IGF-1. Um, IGF-1 is needed for creating memories in the brain and so forth. So there's all these beneficial aspects. Mm -hmm. So it's funny how 
we fall into these tribalistic camps and it's like mm -hmm. this binary thinking where this is good, this is bad. And protein increases IGF-1 cancer, therefore it's bad. But when you understand the nuances and the details and these sort of the context, and I think this is also an important point when we talk about protein, is people's like fitness state. Like, are they lifting weights? Are they doing things? You know, I see some people who are going on a carnivore diet and they don't even exercise and they're having like three ribeye steaks a day. And I'm not saying that's going to be problematic, but I think context really matters and that sort of gets lost. And that's why yeah. I like your content to help people think a little bit more differently about these things. So you mentioned the, the, the suggestion to lower the RDA target of protein. Where should most people who yeah. are trying to stay healthy What's the sweet spot in terms of like preventing obesity? In yeah, uh, another great question and super practical for the listener. The current RDA is 0.8 grams per kilogram. And that is, you know, that really actually hasn't changed for the last 30 years. And if you think about that just in perspective of all the other recommendations that have changed or that we've talked about, whether it's fat or carbohydrates, cholesterol, these things have all changed. But protein, this uh, lowly macronutrient that is arguably the most important macronutrient, right? The most important essential macronutrient, mm -hmm. the recommendations have not changed. It's wild. And the, that 0.8 gram per kilogram, which is the current recommendation, is based on nitrogen balance studies, which is simply the way in which they determine growth, right? For 18, you know, originally it was animal husbandry. What was the cheapest way to feed animals to give them the least amount of protein, uh, the highest amount of carbs, and still get growth? And so they extrapolated that out and utilized that to look at nitrogen balance for 18-year-old men, soldiers. It was really around World War II where um, the, the concept and the perception of protein in terms of how it can help people really uh, was established, although even before that. Um, so my recommendation and the literature supports that at least double that, and that could be 1.6 grams per kilogram would be more optimal. And me personally, I recommend one gram per pound ideal body weight. That is on the higher end. But I, I believe that I can uh, justify why why that would be. Mm -hmm. uh, one gram per pound ideal body weight, you know, so I'm 110 pounds. That's 110 grams of protein. Not that hard to do. It's not that hard to, it's yeah. not that hard to do. And then people can decide if they want carbohydrates or fats after that. Based upon their activity level, exactly. their body composition goals, all of that. Based upon their activity level, based upon are they, you know, insulin sensitive? Can they tolerate carbohydrates? Are they training? Mm -hmm. um, really important. Yeah. Now this 110 grams for you. Yeah. Um, you travel a lot. I do. But you're a mom. You're busy. <laughs> like, is this an everyday thing, or do we sort of think about this like over the course of a week? You know, like what do you? Uh, think? Yeah. Uh, another great question. I think about it in terms of every day. Um, you know, protein, the capacity to store protein really doesn't exist other than the amino acid reservoir in our muscles. But it's interesting, you know, when you think about the essential amino acids, you do need to have those. Um, can you go through periods of uh, protein restriction? You can, and, and we'll talk about that. But for me, the one gram per pound ideal body weight is a daily thing. That's not to say that an individual couldn't go through a period of time, say four days for protein restriction. I think that we may find evidence that that is beneficial at some point. And when I say protein restriction, what kind of protein am I really targeting? I'm, I'm really targeting the uh, methionine and the sulfur amino acids, which are just a, a, a section, you know, a kind of amino acid, which, which I think is where uh, Longo's work comes in and these protein restriction camps. But I don't think it's a lifestyle. I mean, you're talking about very targeted, specific times. And this would be a cyclical thing it would so be. as to induce autophagy exactly. or something like that? Yes, a stress. So it's, you know, for the science nerds out there, it's the integrated stress response. Okay. So the, it's the, the, those sulfur amino acids yeah. trigger stress? Um, the, the D, yes. So the imbalance okay. um, of the amino acids and the the restriction of some of them, it does trigger a stress response, which is good. Like so a favorable thing. A favorable thing. Like I know that you talk about hormesis and mm. ways in which the body can upregulate itself for aut autophagy, which you said, you know, I use that word very loosely. And these are ways in which you can utilize a cyclical eating pattern. Now, who is this not for? That is not for an aging individual. It is not for someone who is sedentary. Uh, and when I say aging, that could be variable. What, what age is that? You know, I would say aging is really when all your hormones are decreasing. And that's different for anybody. But certainly in your 60s, you should not be doing fasting and you should not be doing protein restriction. That is a huge mistake. And why is it a huge mistake? Well, number one, muscle is the organ of longevity. 
and you have to protect it at all costs. It doesn't get easier. Listen, I wish protecting muscle was just as easy as gaining body fat, but it's, it, not. it's not. And we have to really account for the world in which we live in. So uh, it's critical. That is so fascinating. Yeah, you're influencing my perspectives because in my eyes, the risk of cancer is a little bit high. You know, right. the risk increases with age, but then there is this counterbalance of like, well, you don't, you're already catabolizing muscle at a faster rate. It's harder to put on muscle. Yeah. So I love that perspective and, and, and that association with IGF-1 and, yeah. and all this. Um, Really interesting. Yeah, and what are the other things that we could think of? If people are really concerned about cancer, you know, then they should be really proactive about it. There's, right, there are full body scans, there's a gallery test, there's genetic, there, there's not genetic testing, well, there is genetic testing, but there's also early detection, methylated strains, DNA strains that you can look at. Yeah. Um, but again, cancer, you know, muscle mass, these things, it, muscle is critical. Mm -hmm. That's such an important point. Um, I, I know I wanted to get here a little bit later, but I think assessing muscle, you've talked a lot about this, yeah. and I think you've really helped people conceptualize and think about, okay, we have body fat analysis, we have BMI, yeah. but clinically, there's not really good ways We've to done a terrible job, and I've actually yeah. been pouring over the yeah. literature on this because, um, and you know, a colleague of mine who is here now, you'll meet uh, Dr. Alexis Cowan, who went to Princeton, and she was out of Rabinowitz's lab, which is an amazing lab. You know, we've been pouring over this data and what do we have, right? So we've got these cohort studies, you know, we have epidemiology and nobody can identify what the optimal muscle mass is, or at least not well. And are you ready for why? So how do we look at muscle mass? We look at, are you ready for this? I'm ready. Okay, well, get ready. Um, Cause I'm super pumped about it. <laughs> nice. We have talked a lot about lean body mass. That in the literature, it doesn't, when people talk about lean body mass, the majority of individuals and the majority of individuals that are reading the research and in the literature, they equate that to like skeletal muscle. Would you agree with that? Right. When people think about lean body mass, they are thinking, okay, well then this is like a skeletal muscle thing. Hmm. Lean body mass is not a good marker of skeletal muscle. Hmm. Lean body mass includes total body water, it can, includes blood, it includes everything other than fat tissue. Mm. Even bone would be characterized as- Yeah, um, so, so now you're looking at lean body mass and then fat. Well, in the literature, that's a huge problem because we've actually not had any, I don't wanna say valuable, but consistent way to actually look at skeletal muscle. Right. So these studies, and when we talk about sarcopenia, people, and where, why is this a problem? This is a problem because in the geriatric community and in a lot of the literature, people will say sarcopenia is a decrease in muscle mass. And then now it's like, is it a muscle mass and then muscle function? In the literature, one would, from reading it, you would think, okay, people will say muscle mass doesn't necessarily matter. It's all about performance. So it's not the amount of tissue that you have, but it's actually the functionality. Well, the reason that this is uh, wrong <laughs> is because we just haven't had a good way of identifying skeletal muscle. So mm -hmm. what does that mean? That means that up until recently, we now have some tools. So there's a way in which they look at, um, and I haven't done this, right? So this is, they're starting to do this in my former lab at WashU, but they're looking at creatine and they're, you know, people are ingesting a, a D3 creatine and then they're urinating uh, creatinine out and then they're determining that this is the actual equivalent to muscle mass, so skeletal muscle. So one of the reasons why there's such a disconnect because is because we haven't been able to identify skeletal muscle appropriately mm -hmm. and consistently and you know it's a very difficult tissue but this is why i think it's it's grossly overlooked because everyone's talking about lean body mass and you can have changes in lean body mass and it doesn't necessarily correlate to improved gait speed or improved performance but it does when you look at muscle mm -hmm. and one more thing yeah yeah i love it S adipose tissue so and you know who's really pioneered this is a guy named uh, dr william evans and he coined this term sarcopenia. And you know, he kind of, I wouldn't say that he coined the term sarcopenia, but he really laid it on the table for the rest of the individuals that are interested in the aging population. Um, one of the things that's so important is that when he looked at the data, it's fat mass didn't matter related to performance, mm. but skeletal mass did. Yet here we are always talking about adiposity.
And actually that had no impact on performances that we'll that we think about when it comes to survivability, like gate, seat, gate speed, sit and stand test, mm -hmm. um, things that we measure, grip strength. And these are things that you measured as a geriatrician. As right? a, yeah, Working we measured it. all that, yeah. And would that be standard? <laughs> like if, if someone yeah. was 77 and they're like, families worried about Alzheimer's or yes. something, these are tests that are- A are... geriatrician would, would measure this, yes. Okay. But we wouldn't necessarily, you know, what are the ways to measure skeletal muscle? You can do a CT, no one's gonna do that. You can do an MRI. MRI, who's gonna pay for that? Mm -hmm. You can do an in-body, okay, right? So bioimpedance, or there's this potential uh, new way of looking at things, which is again, this uh, creatine and creatinine. Um, That's cool. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see if it, it correlates. It's not being done in clinical practice yet. It's, mm -hmm. it's still just being used in research. But again, one of the reasons why I think we've really missed the importance of skeletal muscle is we haven't had a good way of consistently measuring it. Uh, because you can, let's say, even if we look at the amount, the mass of the skeletal muscle, we, we can't identify the quality of the tissue, right? And yeah. we know that uh, fat can infiltrate the tissue. There's a decrease in flux, meaning, you know, you get not just triglycerides, but you get these um, fatty acid, you know, fat, ceramides, and... diacylglycerol. And again, these are very complex. It depends on where it is in the tissue. It depends on if you are, like, you're very active. You probably have a frequent flux. So your, your tissue doesn't look like a marbled steak over a period of time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that is really important to understand. I think if someone is really interested, they could look at an appendicular skeletal mass index, which mm -hmm. they can Google it. They can, there, you know, there's multiple papers that look at it, but it's not gonna give you an optimal range. So if, if you had your druthers and you could create a test, I mean, I think this is a little bit more it more powerfully influences lifestyle change. So you tell someone, oh, you're overweight, you have too much fat. It's like, oh yeah, I need to lose fat, I need a <laughs> yeah. diet, I need to go on the treadmill, right. I need to do all this. All those things also generally lose, or they come at the expense of losing muscle mass and, and so on. So if you tell people you're under, under muscled, when you improve your muscle mass, as you've talked about, you're increasing your resting metabolic rate, you're getting stronger, you're becoming more insulin sensitive. Like you're, Absolutely. So I think it's a better, it's a more proactive way of- It's the it, only way. Yeah. And also if we can address it now, then all these diseases of aging, listen, it's like, you know, when I think about, cause I, I treat patients in my clinic and I think about all the drugs that we can use to treat diabetes and obesity. That's just treating, none of that is targeted towards muscle, by the way. Right. And if someone were to say, okay, well, I wanna treat your muscle, Dude, the FDA would close you down. Yeah. Or whatever the the medical board would close you down. You can't treat muscle other than testosterone. I mean, maybe there's some indications for some of these other things like nandrolone and oxandrolone for skeletal muscle. But again, uh, a physician would have to be very much able to answer the question as to why, and it has to be within a scope of practice. Mm -hmm. So again, this just highlights how backwards we are. We are so fixated on adiposity that is absolutely a symptom of impaired muscle. I don't care. You know, even we have obesity week. We don't have muscle week. Mm, good point. But the, the issue is if we care about root cause medicine, we cannot care about obesity. That is absolutely like an endpoint. Skeletal muscle insulin resistance, and I hope I'm not going on a bit of a tangent, but everybody knows about insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of the thing that everybody wants to protect themselves against. And insulin resistance, there's multiple ways to become insulin resistant. However, you know, when I, I uh, you know, recently wrote a book and I'm, I'm working on a, a white paper, um, and one of the things that I was examining is the models of obesity. And we know they are calories in, calories out, and then this insulin carbohydrate model of obesity. Now, have you ever looked in depth at any of those models? I mean, I've read the back and forth yeah. with Kevin Hall and yeah, Ludwig exactly. and everything. It's, exactly. it's quite interesting. Okay. But... Uh, myself, ha I have read this as well, and muscle is completely missing from the picture. That's a good point. So wh where is the muscle-centric model of obesity? All of a sudden, insulin resistance just happens like magic. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then it goes to obesity and all these other things. You know, and obviously, obesity and insulin resistance are very complex diseases. I come at it from a geriatrician trained under one of the world-leading experts in protein metabolism. So my perspective is very geared towards that. So I appreciate my own biases. However, we cannot discount the fact that insulin resistance, uh, skeletal muscle accounts for 40% of the body. My husband would joke and say it accounts for 50% of his. <laughs> you know, Mike, you're probably 55. But in, if insulin resistance, insulin resistance, and it is well documented that skeletal muscle becomes insulin resistant. And arguably, potentially even insulin resistant before the liver 
before other tissues. And it's the primary site for glucose disposal. So <laughs> we need to treat that first. And that, you know, and Gary Shulman and Kit Peterson, you know, they did some of the really uh, pivotal work. I don't know if you've seen um, some of their, their work. It, they were, they're uh, out of Yale and this was, gosh, this must have been at least 10 years ago. And they showed insulin resistance in healthy, quote, healthy, sedentary 18-year-olds wow. before they were overweight. Like mm -hmm. there was no issues with obesity. They were considered healthy, sedentary individuals, meaning skeletal muscle insulin resistance can begin decades before we cannot manage the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be our target. Right. Instead of just giving more insulin or SGLT2 inhibitors or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. But really just changing the conversation, number one, getting better at testing skeletal muscle. Mm -hmm. And number two, recognizing early on that, you know, when we have all these uh, conversations about science, the question is, what can we do about it? So what's the, so we talk about all this stuff and then like, what can you do? Number one, you have to be training. You have to have flux in that skeletal muscle and you have to protect skeletal muscle at all costs. And don't be overweight. Yeah. I love it. Um, Getting back to poor muscle quality. Yeah. This, I think, I mean, you you did talk about it in the fat flux and everything like that. I think this is a new concept for a lot of mm -hmm. people unless they've, they've read the research. And, and yeah. we look at conditions, you mentioned insulin resistance, PCOS, which yeah. is related to insulin resistance. There's so many conditions that are now characterized with poor muscle quality, whether it's mitochondrial dysfunction or like the fat flux that you mentioned. Absolutely. Um, if someone is worried like, oh, I'm overweight, I'm insulin resistant, is it suffice it to say that your muscle quality is probably not so good? I have thought about this often, and I would say yes. Uh, again, you know, it's difficult to say, okay, you absolutely, but likely yes. Right. Uh, and you're going to see, you know, um, like you said, uh, elevated levels of insulin, likely at some point, elevated levels of glucose, elevated levels of triglycerides. Also, you're not going to be strong. You know, there's this concept that people will say, okay, well, um, you know, individuals that are obese have more muscle mass. That says nothing about the quality. And not only that, again, you know, and I, and I think a, a lot about muscle, you can be deconditioned, increase strength t 100 to 200%, right? Like, so let's say someone is lifting five pounds and now they're lifting 10 or they're lifting 20. The incremental change in actual muscle mass is very small, right? So these are very, and I say that because these are very complex topics. So you can improve strength, but again, where are we starting from? You know, and it takes a lot to actually build muscle. This, I think, I get a lot of DMs. I know you do too. But a lot of people will say, I started weightlifting and I haven't lost weight or I haven't done this, but they're, but they're stronger. And so in their mind, they're thinking they're not making progress because they're not putting on muscle. But as you just said, like strength precedes hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. So I think it's good for people to, even if, you know, they're new to weightlifting, to not focus so much on just like, okay, I'm putting on maybe my muscles don't look different, but I'm getting stronger. Right. Uh, that's a really good proxy yeah. because strength, and we can talk about all the studies with hand, hand grip strength and longevity and the associations with poor hand grip strength and, and all cause mortality, but strength is a really important proxy. And so what you're saying, what I heard you say is, this is linked with muscle quality. Yeah. Like if you're getting stronger, you're making iterative progress. I, I, I would say that that, I, I absolutely would say that, that what you're saying is correct. I would agree with that. And you're also improving this flux. So you're actually not getting um, like stasis. The, mm. the nutrients, the um, chemicals are not just sitting there. I say chemicals, but what are we talking about? Fatty acids. Mm. It's not just sitting there. The glycogen isn't just sitting there, you know? And, and I think that that's really important. Good. So for folks that are having a hard time building muscle, then you know, think like, hey, at least I'm getting stronger, yeah. you know, and then over Irres time. Irrespective of weight loss, when individuals start exercising, they can improve triglycerides and HDL, irrespective of weight loss. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. There is this exercise factor that I think is not even being touched yet. You know, again, this is some of the earlier work of Pedersen, and she's actually, I think she's in Copenhagen now. Um, but this muscle as an endocrine system is completely missed in the majority of the context of what we're talking about for aging and, and longevity and wellness, right? So muscle as an endocrine system, when you contract it, it releases these myokines, which we've talked about. But what's so interesting about myokines, so when, and the reason I'm saying this is because if someone is getting um, depressed or feeling like, hey, I'm really putting in the work and I'm not changing my body composition, Body composition is one thing. Looking good in a bikini is great. Physical performance as it relates to athletics is also great. From a medical perspective, when you are exercising, you are doing multiple things 
with skeletal muscle leveraging the only organ system that you have voluntary control over. I mean, I guess you can breathe, but the lungs do a lot of other stuff that you have no control over. Skeletal muscle is under voluntary control. This is a whole organ system that is under voluntary control. So what are you going to do with it? Number one, when you are training, um, again, we talked about uh, the flux. We talked about increasing strength. The contractile element of skeletal muscle is extremely interesting. And where is, does that become important? Because as skeletal muscle, and there's 300 or more different myokines, and they all do different things. As these myokines are released into circulation, they partition the way your food is used meaning they partition the way carbohydrates and fat are used. They interact with the immune system. You know, everyone is concerned about their immune system and upregulation of their immune system. Well, exercise, uh, when these interleukins are released, you know, essentially cytokines, which are called myokines, actually can counterbalance inflammatory cytokines released from other variations of the immune system. So I, I love this and I, the context gets lost here and I think it's really important. So if we think of like interleukin-6 being released from mm -hmm. like macrophages or something. It's people inflammatory. Think, That's inflammatory. It's bad. But yeah. when you exercise, right. what happens? It also releases interleukin-6 without a robust increase in TNF-alpha. And people must understand that you're laughing, but yeah. Um, yeah have you said this before? No, no, I <laughs> haven't talked about it, but I've read about it, <laughs> yeah. but it, it's better if you talk about yeah. it. So. Um, you know, we played around with uh, testing this in the clinic. And, uh, you know, we're still kind of playing around looking at interleukin-6 as it relates to clinic. And actually, they will end up being lower. So you get this acute response, and then interleukin-6 ends up being lower. So it's not a more floating around. It's actually less. Mm, I love that. Um, yeah. So it, it's just really interesting, this concept of uh, myokines and where that's going to go as it relates to fitting into, again, medicine. I am not a fitness expert. I am purely looking at... How do we take the best care of people, give them and provide them with the best knowledge so that they can be in control of their health, right? How does their trajectory of aging? And, you know, I, I don't want to circle back, but I kind of want to circle back. People will talk about longevity and that we should reduce dietary protein for, quote, this longevity aspect. Uh, do you know what longevity is? I don't know how I would care. I mean, I'm sure I could make something up, but I don't know how this I would like a characterize question. it. Yeah. So you can definitely say no, because that is I'm I trying to lead yeah. you to because I can't tell you. Yeah. So when individuals are making the argument, okay, well, this is a, a factor that's affecting longevity, then you better tell me, is this six hours? Are we talking six weeks? Hmm. So let's say there is something to chronic overstimulation of mTOR, whether it's from dietary protein, whether it's from you pick your poison. You still need to be able to answer the question, uh, longevity defined as what? And I think that that becomes, because again, I'm a trained geriatrician, meaning I take care of or have specialized in individuals over the age of 65. That was part of my clinical responsibilities as a fellow. I did nutritional science, obesity medicine, which people don't think they're related. It's all related and geriatrics. And I tell you that end of life is not pretty. And if you fall and you break a hip, oh, something else that's really important that I think is not discussed, that I think that muscle mass and the data would support muscle mass is more important than bone quality. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Most individuals that age are going to get osteoporosis. There's nothing that you can do about it. I mean, yes, okay, so I, I say that lightly, but bone quality, let me, let me reframe this in a different way. Bone quality is going to de decrease no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. Let's say you train and you eat protein and you're out in the sun and you're getting vitamin D, K2, all these things, right? And you're on a vibration plate and who knows what, and you're not going to the moon. Your bone quality will decrease. Your muscle mass, you have direct control over that. You have much more capacity to input that. And if, you know, so uh, again, muscle mass, I think, is more important and, and also is going to, um, I don't want to say, you know, like indicate that if you fall and break a hip, you're going to have a problem. But actually, muscle mass is more important in fracture risk than bone quality. Mm -hmm. Muscle mass is more important in fracture risk than bone quality that's so, crazy very important yeah um because these drugs are expensive they have side effects but i think and then if we could drill down mechanistically I, i've seen a lot more about osteosarcopenic obesity so we, yeah. you mentioned sarcopenia yeah and this coalescence so you mentioned you know the 18 year old otherwise healthy kids that actually have insulin resistance yeah. in their muscle what people don't realize is that insulin resistance is linked with or and loss of muscle is linked with 
accelerated degradation of bone. Totally. Like th this is yes. part of the same triad that yes. we've been talking about. Yes. And that's why it's important for people to conceptualize okay, it's not so much about losing fat, it's about building and maintaining muscle and muscle quality. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, sarcopenic obesity is a problem. And you know, uh, sarcopenic obesity is the combination of low muscle mass and strength and then obesity. I mean, that just sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. Right. Um, but, but it's prevalent. I mean, oh, I can't remember I, the, the... And it starts way earlier. So sarcopenia yeah. is, you know, typically defined as aging individuals, right? You're talking about 65 and up. Sarcopenia, if we look at the definition and we say decrease muscle mass and function, you're talking about individuals in their 30s. If you could enumerate that. Yeah. 20%, 30%. I mean, Gosh. people that I've worked with, probably yeah. 30, 40%, I would say, like probably. under 60. And then over 60, probably a majority yeah. of people um, are under-muscled. So uh, I would say the majority of all, pe I would say yes. I would say easily we can take those that are in the obesity. So is that what, 40% of the population? Then we already know 40% of the population. Again, we're, we're say, you know speaking about this in very black and white terms, and they're certainly not. But I don't know. Maybe you could say 40% of the population is actually under-muscled. Wow. And the issue is we are still treating symptomology, and we're still focused on symptomology, and that's a problem especially when you think about all the things that input into insulin resistance, you know, and I was, you know, think about muscle, I think about like muscle as a suitcase and all these kind of inputs that affect its capacity, you know, whether it's insulin resistance, whether it's, you know, increase in inflammation, systemic inflammation, right? Because you know, when there's systemic inflammation, it affects muscle and muscle becomes more insulin resistant. You know, you think about decreased mitochondria, which goes along with the listener cares about that because it decreases energy, mm -hmm. decreases energy utilization, increase in fatigue. Mm -hmm. All these things. Um, for clinical biomarkers, for people that just run like a Chem 24 or CBC mm -hmm. differential, I think of like liver enzymes, just mm -hmm. associations with insulin resistance yep. as a way to maybe triangulate. Mm -hmm. What? How would you conceptualize that? Yeah, um, well, one of the things that I always look at is I obviously look at fasting insulin and fasting glucose. I also look at, and by the way, individuals that are on a higher protein diet, their glucose tends to run a little bit higher. And, and could that be th because of the generation of the body's own glucose, like gluconeogenesis, possibly? You know, uh, sometimes we do su see higher levels of cortisol. I, I don't know the reason as to why, um, but typically their A1Cs are, and maybe the red blood cells live longer. Uh, the, the, the A1Cs though are typically all within range. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, when I think about that and then fasting insulin and then triglycerides should be less than 100. And of course, liver enzymes, it tricky should be, you know, if you are an athlete or if you are someone that trains, you will have higher liver enzymes. Mm -hmm. And um, higher creatinine too. Yep, which oh, absolutely. So that's another, that's great. So you want to, so if you're gonna get a creatinine and GFR for kidney function and you are heavily muscled, you should get a cystatin C and get a corrected GFR. Okay, I don't know that. What mm -hmm. is that? So it's just a it's a marker that the urologists use or the nephrologists use to get a corrected uh, kidney filtration rate. I see. Okay, and that's probably something you could just check off. Yeah. Like it's not like an esoteric test. That no, people need no, to, not yeah. at all. Okay, not at all. That's really good. It's interesting. You know the 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 framework. Like when people are healthy, their lipids or their their blood looks so different compared to people who are unmetabolically. And then the context right. matters. Like I've had uh, one client who did an exercise session, like a HIT session, went and got a standard lipid test and the LDL cholesterol was 400. And the creatinine was, I wanna say it was like close to two. Mm -hmm. And so the lab actually called and said, hey, what's going on with the patient? And it was like, oh, client. And well, they just actually did a HIT training session before. So I think context really yeah. matters. Um, not to deviate too much, but this is just a sidebar with lipids. Do you do, there's this whole talk about lipid load testing and looking at non-fasted lipids? Yeah, I think it's a great, I think it's great conceptually. I don't do it, but I do think that it's great. So basically people are saying that it doesn't matter what your fasting lipids are, it, it matters what your challenged lipids are. Um, mm. You know, for me, I don't do it. I'm much more interested in ApoB, I'm much more interested in LP little a, and I'm much more interested in more advanced testing like the Clearly test that looks at hard and soft plaque and mm. looks, you know, or an endopat or a CIMT. I think that um, just like looking at muscle mass, body fat percentage, if you are looking at blood work that is solely blood work without looking at the heart or the arteries, you're missing it. Great point. This is another question I want to ask you because what is the heart? It's a muscle. Yeah. So when we think about, well, heart disease kills more people than COVID and all these other things, 
um, you see all these people, they're overweight, under muscled. And why would we assume that their heart, which is a muscle, would be healthy? Um, and I know the coronary arteries can get occluded yeah. and, and all that. But how do you think about that heart disease from a muscle centric standpoint? Like, yeah, exercise is so good for the heart muscle and everything. Yeah. Walk us through that. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I have a, a cardiologist on staff at my practice, and he has his own practice at Dr. Twyman. So I am definitely not a cardiologist. However, I will say that when I think about cardiovascular activity and the heart, I do, you know, people get, or cardi, cardi, cardiovascular activity has been getting a bad rap. True or not true? True. Everyone's like, yeah, don't yeah. do cardio. You don't need to do cardio. And I think that there's benefit to it. Yeah. I do think that zone two training is very beneficial. Um, and I know that uh, some people may disagree and, that, and that's perfectly fine, but there is a component of um, mitochondria efficiency and really keeping that mitochondria healthy and mitochondria density. And the data would support that in chronic exercisers, even in older chronic exercises, that their mitochondria actually looks the same hmm. as a 30 year old. Mm. Uh, and that's obviously not a heart biopsy. These are muscle biopsies. But you would assume that if you are improving mitochondria density in skeletal muscle that, you know, in order to leverage that and get there, you are probably improving cardiovascular tissue. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. Um, I mean. So speaking of that, what sort of training? I want to get to some of your specifics, like what yep. you're doing. You're having, we were talking offline, you're having a lot more carbs now. <laughs> yeah. What does your training look like? How many days a week? What's yeah. the frequency and cadence? For So for me, I always think, okay, am I... Um, you know, like what's happening in my life. I obviously just wrote a book. I have two very little kids. So I was focusing on strength and I was doing three days a week of heavy lifting, mostly heavy lower body training. Nice. Not a ton of upper body because, you know, I just seem to maintain being fit there, doing lots of uh, push ups with my kids on my back, but nothing crazy. And then one day a week of some kind of interval training. Mm -hmm. And whether it's high intensity or sprint interval training, it's one or uh, one or the other, and then I will add in some cardiovascular activity, um, like uh, like as a uh, to cap off that exercise session or throughout the week. Like throughout the week, like, okay. separate. Throughout the week, separate. Yeah. But I'm really interested in changing it up. I'm just getting to the point where I'm super bored, so I'll probably do more metabolic conditioning mm -hmm. because um, I enjoy it. It's fun for you. It's fun. Do you think that's an important aspect for making this a habit for people? I mean, people see CrossFit and then they're like, oh, maybe I should do this because it's yeah. popular or because yeah. the person that I follow on Instagram does it. But I, I always encourage clients like, hey, if you like yoga, fine, like do yeah. yoga, but also lift weights. You have to lift weights. Yeah. And um, I don't think that there's a replacement for that. And there's a lot of discussion in, in this space. Is it strength or is it hypertrophy? And there's a continuum. When you train for strength, will you get some hypertrophy? Yes. When you train for hypertrophy, will you get some strength? Yes. Uh, both are really valuable, and I think it depends on what season you're in. Um, I I do believe that you should, you know, and I was just talking to, um, do you know Dr. Samuel Buckner? Mm -hmm. He's amazing, and he's mm -hmm. another one of these more quiet scientists who are not totally uh, out in the public, like banging their chest, which I love uh, about them because they're usually really great scientists. And, you know, we were talking about muscle hypertrophy, and the question is, you know, I asked him, I said, well, do you think it's really important for muscle hypertrophy so that you increase the storage capacity of muscle? Mm -hmm. So basically, you and I were talking from the beginning, how do we allow ourselves to be the healthiest we can? And number one, we are in an environment that's uh, hyper palatable. And where do we do? Or even if you're not, what do we do with these calories? Mm -hmm. Those that those carbohydrates, that stuff goes to muscle. It would make a conscious, it would just make sense, you know, to increase that storage capacity. I said to him, so what do you think about that that concept? And he's like, well, um, conceptually, that makes sense. But you will always have to continue on once you reach a certain age, post puberty, the gains that you make are actually very small. And not only that, you have to continuously train in that way to maintain that tissue, which I still think is really valuable. Right. Yeah. And so um, progressive overload principles. Yeah, and, and, of course. Yeah. But there's a, there's this perception. Um, and I think it's, thankfully it's changing, that weightlifting will turn women into these mass monsters and things <laughs> like wish. that. I wish, no. So yeah. can you help um, our female audience better yeah. understand that, that is that, is there any merit to that no. conversation? Where did that come from? I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think that it probably comes from the time of the bodybuilders where you're seeing them doing, you know, lifting and, and somehow that translates over. Women can gain muscle mass typically half the rate mm -hmm. and it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, Does that change with menopause as well? It's a great question. I, so I personally 
uh, I struggle with this. I, I struggle with this question because uh, I would assume yes because of the declining hormones, but that's not always the case. I do see women that are very focused on training and are very disciplined in their capacity, and I don't see them have body composition changes. Mm -hmm. I would say that I echo that. If they're physically fit going into yes. menopause, and then or what happens I've seen with clients is they wait until menopause. They have a lot of issues, mm -hmm. sleep issues, hot flashes in this, and then they want to make lifestyle changes. Right. But I think having that base, that foundation uh, earlier on, you know, I think is very helpful. One hundred percent. You know, and there's a lot of discussion on hormones. You know, will these hormones change? Uh, will they change the outcome of menopause? Nobody is giving, typically, the standard of care is you're not giving hormones to adjust body composition. I mean, it's just not the standard of care. So you're not giving someone estrogen and assuming that her body composition is going to change. And I'm not saying it does or it doesn't, but, um, you know, typically the modalities are exercise and diet. Mm -hmm. Since you mentioned hormones, I have a controversial question. Oh, I uh, love controversial questions. There's a, there's a big push. YouTube may <laughs> yeah. not like that. There's a big push to give um, gonadotropin receptor blockers to children uh, who are have ambiguous um, gender identity. Um, and the the people promoting this say it's it's reversible. Like if you give a kid a puberty blocker and they decide that they want to continue on so with So they're giving a puberty blocker. Help me said this. I'm not familiar with this. They're giving a puberty blocker to, to uh, allow for a child to... Um, as they're deciding on their um, identified gender, and the yeah. it's under the sort of um, the 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 assumption is like, well, if you remove the puberty blocker, puberty will resume after you administer this. And to me, I think that's crazy. I've uh, never heard. So I've uh, been a physician since two thousand and six. I have never, and a fellowship trained physician, I have never heard medicine stepping in in that way. I think that that is, I think um, behaviors like that begin to play with fire. Mm. I agree. I, I mean, mean, that is your job is to not do harm as a physician. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, I, I, there's a lot of uh, gender affirming care mm. workshops for doctors and I've, I've looked at some of the PDFs mm. and so forth. And so this is, I think maybe it's on the fringe right now, mm. but I think this is, you know, being, you know, doctors are being encouraged to learn more about this and to be able to utilize this in, in their practice. So I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, that will not be happening in my practice. Right. Good. Um, you mentioned you train legs three days a week. I do. Uh, so there was a- That's because they're so scrawny, but yeah. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the thing about the legs that there's difference within the regions in the body mm -hmm. of the muscle. And I would love for you to speak on that because I think a lot of people sort of neglect, especially men neglect their legs that yeah. work on upper body. You mean Monday's universal chest day? Every gym, <laughs> anywhere, it's crazy. Yeah. Like even in Canada or like wherever. Yeah. Um, so can we talk about why, why is it that the legs, the musculature in the legs become insulin resistant first? Uh, that's a, a great question. I am gonna guess and say that it's likely due to mass. Um, that would be my, Again, because uh, the fiber types are all different, but I'm assuming, yeah, it's, it's likely due to mass. Mm -hmm. Do you have an answer? Because I don't. I don't know. I, don't I think. Know. Yeah. I mean, Ben Bickman and I talked about yeah. it. He thinks it could be related to use, uh, meaning that humans were sort of evolved or mm -hmm. natural selection geared us towards moving our legs a lot to go out and hunt, and forage, and gather, and everything like that. And since we're not moving as much, they might um, they've just been adapted to that movement, mm -hmm. and so therefore that that might be why they become insulin resistant first. That's but. interesting. I, you know, I would think that we are moving our legs more than we're moving our upper body, especially. You know, to me, I would say. Um, if I were to think about it that way, then it would be the non-dominant hand that would become insulin resistant first. Mm -hmm. But because you're, you've got to get up to go to the bathroom and, and all those things. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. Okay, um, let's finish up on some carnitines and carbs. So you, we you talked about creatine loading and looking at the creatinine levels yeah. as, a, as a test. That's and again, like, this is new. I haven't instituted it yet. I don't even know if it's going to be available. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is some promise there in looking at uh, um, as a marker for skeletal muscle mass. Are you taking creatine? Um, not right now, no. Okay. Because but I think it's great. So I think yeah. So if I were to recommend supplements, I would recommend creatine. I would recommend vitamin D. I'd recommend fish oil. I'm really big into urolithin A. Have you heard of Mitopure? Mm, I'm I've really, heard of it. I don't, tell us about it. So I'm really interested in urolithin A. I, I think that it is a compound that 40% of individuals don't make. And it's... Um, it's not, it's like a prebiotic, but it basically can come from these red, you know, can come from walnuts, raspberries, pomegranates, and it impacts mitochondria. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, It impacts the turnover of mitochondria. Okay. And there's multiple ways in which it impacted, but there's some really good data, at cool. least promising data so far. So I've been really big into this lately. Yeah. I, I met with those guys, uh, the, the people that represent that company, mm-hmm. and they said, well, you have to take it for 90 days before mm-hmm. you notice anything. Um, but you said 40% of people have a, like a defect. In or this. just a, a not, a, they don't have the genetic capacity to make it, to make your A. Wow. So that's on your must-have list, along with vitamin D. Yeah, and lately, yeah, I'm very that's into it, cool. yes. And it's really hard for me to get excited about something. Uh, you know, I never was super excited about resveratrol. I mean, mm. it, it's okay, because, uh, you know, we did some of that work, um, you know, a lot of labs do. And listen, there's great promise, but I think that you have to pick and choose. Well, it's so expensive. It's like 120 bucks a month. I mean, you could get <laughs> yeah. a lot of vitamin D and fish oil yeah. and, you know, yeah, buy yeah. steaks for that. Um, <laughs> Lots of steaks, yep. So... You don't take creatine, but do you recommend, or not I do. right now? No, right. I do. I do yeah. recommend creatine. I think cool. creatine, you know, creatine is great for brain function. And especially individuals who are steering away from red meat, they should definitely, I mean, I think obviously check with your physician, but creatine is, is wonderful. Mm-hmm. And it, it's above and beyond um, exercise fatigue. Right. Brain health. And totally. Okay. Um, if there's a vegan or vegetarian who's still listening up to this point of our conversation. Yeah, they haven't turned us off. <laughs> what are some must-haves that they should include? Because there Branch is- chain amino acids. This is the point to use a brown chain or an essential amino acid okay. with a meal. So not, again, we talked about chronic stimulation of mTOR. That is one of the reasons why you shouldn't be, um, you know, like snack. I, I think snacking is a bad idea. And also, you know, snacking, it's really, it's not the snacking in and of itself. It's the, what are you pushing forward? Like, what is the, uh, the what are the pathways that you're pushing forward? So if you are vegan or vegetarian with your lower protein meal, you can add in a scoop of branch chains or you can add in a scoop of creatine and branch chains to like three ounces of fish or your soy burger. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now, the clinically, um, I know we might rub some toes here uh, or, or irritate some people, but have you seen people that have done vegan right and have been able to maintain their strength and muscle mass throughout lifespan? Do you think there's a subset of the population who that works for? Yeah. Is it ideal, optimal? So I, I have thought a lot about that. And I had one friend, she is a she had been, has been vegan for a very long time. And up until, gosh, I would say she's now in her 50s, I would say she was able to thrive on a vegan diet, and I'm just not seeing it anymore. Mm. Uh, You know, that being said, also my patient population is not particularly vegan. Um, Could an individual thrive in that way? I think there is a subset of the population that has the potential to be optimized on a more vegan vegetarian diet. And I'm gonna tell you the mechanism of why I think. And I think that that's related to the gut microbiome. There is some evidence to suggest that depending on an individual's gut microbiome, that those bacteria can scavenge and actually get essential amino acids from the bacteria. Interesting. And that's, I mean, but is that for how long they can do it? Is this an eight week thing? I don't know. Um, You know, what is that thing? You know, what do we think about that in terms of optimizing muscle? You know, I think that that is a risky way to go, Um, but can it be done? And for some people, I think that again, it really depends on the makeup of the person, and we just don't know enough about it. But I think it has to do with the gut microbiome. Like maybe East Asian people, something from India, whatever. Yeah, Maybe 2% or less of the population. Mm-hmm. I mean, we typically don't see individuals thrive in that way. Right. It just becomes difficult, right? As individuals age, um, the fiber content with the protein, right, it, it binds it. It's not as bioavailable. The other aspect is the quality zinc iron again i've taken care of older patients they're not wanting to consume more you're lucky you're getting one meal in them right which was what i was going to ask you next is about um bolus dosing versus there's that whole nibbling versus gorging study and there's a one related study to that where they had elderly women consume it was like one or two meals all of their protein recommendations and then had younger women consume like three or four meals and space it out Mm. so is that bolus dose? Do you re- generally recommend? Because we've talked For about sure. that before. And right. actually, uh, since the last time we spoke, I've changed my positioning on what that looks like. And I would say that that first meal of the day is most important. Um, you know, I was talking. Do you know Katie Holmes? I've heard the name. She's amazing. She's right. uh, one of the the senior uh, scientists at at Whoop. And we were talking about this circadian eating pattern. And typically, I would say it doesn't. So I may change my tune on this. Um, I typically say it doesn't matter when you have your first meal. I I may be rethinking that. I may think that the first meal of the day that you should be feeding within, 
you know, the earlier waking hours and potentially stopping as the sun goes down, Mm -hmm. potentially. That being said, the first meal of the day, whenever at this point you eat it, should be, you know, should be, I don't want to say highest in protein, but it should be very robust, between 30 to 50 grams, if not higher. Why? Because you are now in a catabolic state. You are coming up after an overnight fast. Your body is primed. And this would be the time to really hit a robust amount. And really, we know that the minimum amount to stimulate muscle protein synthesis is about 30 grams. Younger if someone is younger, or less if someone is younger. But a more optimal range is likely closer to 50. And that first meal of the day, depend, you know, is really important. And then the second meal, you know, we don't actually know how long muscle protein synthesis and mTOR is stimulated. We don't actually know. It could be five hours. It could be six. We don't actually know. So that second meal may be less important. Mm. And then that third meal, that last meal before, let's say you're doing, or whatever it is, but your last meal before you're going into an overnight fast. Sufficient protein. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, it's 50 grams, maybe Mm -hmm. even a little higher, I dare say. But how many people are actually doing this, right? I mean, most people are fasting all day. They'll have a salad at lunch Mm -hmm. with a little chicken. um, And for dinner, it might be another salad and like a little tuna or whatever. So um, not many people are hitting these these targets. so that's one point. The other thing is that the quality of the protein, I'm a big fan of red meat. Yeah. Uh, I've had chickens and turkeys and all that. Um, and just seeing how, I mean, they eat grain, right? Um, whereas the ruminants are eating grass, which is nice. How do you steer people away? Uh, I mean, if they like chicken, fine. Yeah. But- I mean, I just don't, I, I don't steer people away. I mean, I certainly think that the red meats and the ruminants are more nutrient dense. And they're also upcyclers. Mm. They take marginal land, which we can do nothing with, we can't even grow anything, and they upcycle it to nutrients that are highly bioavailable for human consumption. Mm. And you know, the fact that we get to choose to eat it is a luxury. Right, this is true. But there's a big push to uh, influence people to not eat that because of climate change and these things. And, and I love that you've been talking a lot about this on your podcast and interviewing people that are actually studying this because yeah. there's a lot of activists out there who don't understand exactly it's The what mouse we- with the microphone. So we wh- cannot eat our way out of climate change. It's not going to happen. So the question is, why are we even still talking about it? It's hard to disentangle now politics from science, yeah. which is sad. It's it is, like it become is very one and the same. Yeah, it is sad. It, mm. Yeah, no, go ahead. I, I totally agree with you. I think that this idea that we can eat our way out of climate change and the concept of Meatless Monday, and if people are interested, they can listen to my podcast with Frank Mitlerner. And, you know, people have tried to discredit him. This guy, he doesn't care what the answer is. He just wants to know what the answer is. Mm. You know, climate change is a population-based issue. Climate change is industry, electricity, and transportation. And if you care about that, fine. And you live in Minnesota, then I don't know, don't eat your avocados, whatever it is. Right. But you're not going to eat your way out of climate change. Yeah. I mean, that is the paradox, right? Where yeah. people will say, oh, I'm going vegan for the environment. And then you look at their ports, there's Amazon boxes piled totally. up. And Absolutely. You're like, okay, well, I mean, if you look at like the, the, the greenhouse gases created to deliver that from China and then same day deliver all these yeah. things, you're like, well, it's kind of hypocritical. Uh, and so I don't think people are thinking through these things. They just hear sound bites. Do you think they're not thinking through it? What do you think they... I'm trying to understand it myself. <laughs> I mean, I what wanna... do you think the issue is? Because... I think it's just, you know, a lot of people get their information from NPR and CNN and mm. these mainstream, and it's like there's an agenda now, uh, post COVID, about, you know, pushing the environment is the big agenda. And I think a lot of people um, feel as though they're making a big difference mm. by having the, the Beyond Meat burger instead. Like, oh, I'm making a, a major difference. Um, but talk about unsustainability of, of using, you know, these, these commercial crops and so forth um, to bring these burgers that still need to be refrigerated. And, and you know, I don't know. It's, Interesting, but I love how you're enumerating the actual uh, differences. Like if everyone in America has a meatless Monday, the change, the delta in greenhouse gases is 0.6%. Yeah, Yeah, and you would have to be vegan for two years to uh, balance out one transatlantic flight. What I think is really interesting is that there is creating this huge division. And that's nonsense. You know, whatever these climate change, be vegan, eat meat because the environment, uh, while all a while, right, behind the, you know, curtain, these guys are like, these people are so stupid. Yeah. I cannot, you know, they're, you're talking about big industry, mm-hmm. talking about big industry creating massive issues with climate change, not whether you're eating Beyond Burger. Like, first of all, and I don't even know who owns the technology for Beyond Burger, right? So who stands to profit? But the fact that people are buying into this uh, argument is surprising. 
and it's also it creates division if you want if you don't want to eat meat because you like you know morris the cow fine but if you are saying it's because of health reasons or you are saying it's because of climate change then i think that there needs to be a re-education and also understanding that we are not here to be divided right like, that doesn't solve problems it just no it more. is a complete smoke screen so I've heard you ask many guests this very question. So I would like to ask you, why do you think there's this big push? Is it because people stand to benefit from creating these novel plant-based products and it's a, a new industry? You know what I really think? Okay. I think it's distraction. Hmm. I think while it's almost like if you take a ball uh, for a puppy and you throw it, that's what I think is happening. Hmm. I'm not sure that anyone is caring so much about our health. I think that it is being utilized as a distraction because if we're arguing here about things that are like ridiculous, then we're going to turn a blind eye to the things that we can change. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people are not thinking that high level about these issues, so I like, I appreciate that. Um, so when does the book come out? September. Amazing, cool, what's it called? Forever Strong. Love it, okay. And it's gonna be about these very concepts about muscle and nutrition for health at any age and really, it. I have to say it kind of goes against what the current um, longevity narrative is. And are you putting your neck out there a little bit by putting out this content in a way? Like, I mean, I don't know. How long have I been talking about this? A long time. How long have we known? I mean, yeah, yeah. it's been at least seven years Yeah. where yeah. nobody would listen to anything that I was saying. I mean, I don't know if that's entirely no, a lot, true. No, no, tons of people. No, no, <laughs> like, tons but of people back listen. in the, but you know, yeah. in the beginning when I was talking about these concepts, I think people were uninterested in sarcopenia and uninterested in muscle health, except as it relates to fitness potential. And that's totally missing the mark. So am I, am I sticking my neck out? I don't know, because it's all I've ever done. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Now, can people, when is the pre-sale going to happen? Uh, February. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. All right. So shortly yeah, after I'm excited. this launches. Yeah, I, I'm excited. Um, it's been a lot of hard work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's finish up on a few personal things. So you have young kids at home. I do. Um, it's important for them to get protein, mm -hmm. not you know Lego, Ego waffles and pop tarts. A lot of people feed their kids that. Um, I know with my daughter, she's picky, so she likes lamb. Sometimes she likes eggs, sometimes not. Yeah. What have you found as a good protein source for parents for kids? Um, so ground beef is great. My kids love ground beef, and then you can put things in it. Uh, so ground beef, we you know you can hide liver in it uh, my kids love steak and they actually they like chicken they like eggs they actually eat a lot of dairy so mm. they they like a lot of goat type dairy nice. um and then they love berries too cool and also the other thing is we never really exposed them to the stuff to junk yeah yeah i mean i you know i do travel quite a bit and when i came home are you ready for this there were frosted mini wheats in my, oh my cover goodness. Did you have a meltdown? I did. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, oh my God. I get these what's out of wrong here. With it? Frosted yeah. mini wheats, honey bunches, like mm -hmm. this stuff. I'm like, the kids will never see this. Yeah, yeah. So I was the crazy person with the bag and like the pajamas and the big fluffy boots going outside, yeah, yeah. throwing out this bag. But right. yeah. Well, it's hard. I mean, especially which it's very important to entrain your children early mm -hmm. on because they develop a palate for these hyper palatable foods. Yeah. And that's a harder habit to break. So yeah. I love that. Yeah, and um, not to go off on a sidebar because I feel like we're probably finishing up. Uh, one of the things that is very interesting is that there's a natural strength that develops when children are still growing. So you mentioned like, could you block puberty? Well, you know, muscle development is critical during that time. Mm -hmm. And once that time is over, that's their period to develop this quote, natural strength. Um, which means like you could probably be totally not trained to go on the bench press and you're going to be able to do a, a certain standard amount of weight, right? Mm -hmm. And that is probably much higher than say someone who in their adolescent never, tra never trained. Mm -hmm. And that's called natural strength. And that natural strength typically once that uh, puberty is over, that is not, you know, like that's it. Right. So it's important to get keep your kids active. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. They, they should be doing push-ups. No, but I'm, truly, yeah. like now we've got the iPad and people are completely zoned out and, you know, you're taking away their ability to build up that natural strength. And I think that that's really important because kind of as that window closes, that's who they are now for the rest of adulthood. Yes, you can get stronger, but the natural strength is something different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And why would you want to deprive your child of that? They may or may not become an athlete, but at least they'll has have that foundation. Has nothing, exactly. It has nothing to do with that. Yep. 
it's scary. Like, you know, I, I, my daughter's 10 and at, at the school there's kids with iPhones and it's not just that one kid has the phone, it's yeah. that they're all attracted to it. So I've seen kids at the park playing and one kid comes up with a phone and it's like, there's cra- they all just circle mm-hmm. around it and they stop playing. And to me, that's very sad. Yeah, um, That's a whole nother, like for a long time, all we, as parents, all we had to deal with was the food and like maybe back. Yeah, to, yeah. Now we have phones, food, we have all sorts no, of stuff. No, it's crazy. There's yeah. a lot of things, you know, as a parent now, you gotta like navigate around. I agree. It's tough. Gabrielle, I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing such great info. Um, so your podcast is available on iTunes and yeah, everywhere. The Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show. Super cheesy name, but I only do that so people can find me. Yeah. Um, they can find me on my website. And um, I see patients all over the world, actually. Everything is remote. And we have a whole team of providers. That's awesome. Which is amazing. And if people are interested, they can sign up for my newsletter on my website. And I'm very active on Instagram and Twitter and YouTube, actually. Awesome. And uh, pretty much everywhere that you can find social media yeah you're out there putting out good good content so thank you meaningful content i hope oh yeah no it gets a lot of engagement i love like the memes when they're you're picking (laughs) on uh protein it's so funny you just like post it and you know people are like ah you're not supposed to post it and like leave it but i don't i don't really actually spend much time on instagram because then it takes away from me being able to read and actually um you know keep an eye right because the the time is finite and it's all we have yeah yeah so that's important I think that's the biggest challenge. Like yeah. we have so much access to technology and um, information, yeah. but our biggest challenge is how to call our attention back from all the distractions totally. you know, and actually focus. Like you got books behind you. There's all this stuff in PubMed. I just turn my phone off during the day and then I'll check in a little bit and turn it off. I don't <laughs> yeah. know, like little batches. I hide it. I don't even know where it is. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. That's the best strategy. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much.